My name is Mike Gabin, and welcome to my KSB campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, we got the Karayim back from its polar orbit around the moon. And now this episode is going to be about uh, getting it ready for its next mission, which is going to be to take a lander up to the moon and land there. But before we get to that, we're going to need to do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of shifting about. Starting off with uh, getting this uh, Karayan crew back down. We'll get Carol down here first. She was down to the moon and she's going to carefully get the science from the uh, orbital module from the Karayan and bring that over to the curse dock before she heads down. Uh, we're also going to get Jeb and Bill back down to the surface so that we can cash in their experience from going down to the moon. And we're also going to get Luya, which we rescued from orbit uh, was it last? No, it was the episode before we first met her. Oh my gosh, that was a while ago. Um, and uh, we're going to get her down to the surface as well just to finish off that particular contract. Now the station here only has two descent vehicles and each vehicle can only hold two crew. So uh, it's going to be Jeb and Bill that are going to have to wait for the next ride down. And, and in fact, I also have Glafia on here as well. So... Um, I have more Kerbals than I have ability to get them down. So I'm not going to move Bill or Jeb or Glafia until I get another uh, vehicle up here. Because I don't like leaving people on the station without a descent vehicle. Although they do have the Karayan, but the Karayan cannot descend down to the surface. So that's just me. But anyway, uh, speaking of Glafia, Glafia is going to go out there and uh, disconnect the curse stock so that... Uh, Chrissy and Luya can get back to the surface and you might have noticed while she was out there she snagged a couple of solar panels and that's because the Karayan you might recall last episode during arrow breaking lost a pair of deployable solar panels uh, so well you know the service module from the curse dock is going to be uh, detached and burn up in the atmosphere anyway so we might as well put these things to use at least they're gonna fill up the gap here <laughs> so I don't know I can maybe convince myself it was always this way, though it wasn't. So with that all out of the way, it was time to get Carol and Luya back down to the surface. Now Luya, not Luya, Carol, sorry, she gained three experience points for her orbit about the moon, which gives her eight, which should be enough to get her up to level two. This will be my first Kerbal getting up to level two, so that's kind of exciting. Anyway, the descent itself, entirely routine. Uh, nothing spectacular happened, so we'll just cut to the recovery. Okay, so 40.5 science. Uh, it's not a lot, but remember I transmitted almost all of it, including all of those uh, EVA reports, so that's not surprising. And, yeah, I got cost the capsule back, and go, wait, Carol didn't go up a level? It says three experience point gained. Luya went up a level, I knew that would happen, but... Why on earth did Carol not go up a level? I don't understand that. Three experience should have put her at eight. Where's Carol here? Carol, there she is. She's at eight. And the bar is like, what? What she need? She's like, just below? Like she needs 8.1? That's ridiculous. I mean, two experience points is what you need to go to level one. Eight, it said on the wiki at... Uh, the Kerbal to KSP wiki is what you need to go to level two. <sighs> I guess she needs to get more experience. Oh, that's disappointing. Well, moving on. This is a fuel barge. I've done a fuel barge before, though you just got a very brief glimpse at my now fully upgraded launch pad so that's excited so my launch pad now has no longer any size or weight restrictions so that's fantastic um and the fuel barge you've seen me do a fuel barge before though this fuel barge i remembered to put some rcs on it so i actually can maneuver the silly thing and uh, I put on a hefty supply of monoprops that'll be able to top up all the different vessels' monoprops. But the ascent itself, again, pretty routine. You've seen a vessel very, very similar to this before, except this time I will be able to dock the thing, thanks to my lack of a dopey design that I had last time. And we'll just run this at two times speed to get this over with. With, once again, uh, docking alignment indicator helping out. Especially with these uh, dockings where the docking port is actually on the other side of the station from where the uh, 
vessel came in from. And then, of course, once it's docked, it's just a matter of transferring over all the resources into the various vessels that are connected to the station and into the station itself. The station itself is actually uh, kind of a gas station. And then uh, we'll just undock and deorbit the actual barge. And with that bit of business taken care of, it's time to make a very brief visit over to the moon where uh, I finally have gotten my communication network about the moon the way I want it. So here we are with JunkSat 3 and I have JunkSat 2 targeted and you can see here that my phase angle is 239 which is only one degree off from my target of 240 so for me that's close enough. So what I'm doing is I'm time warping until my altitude is 1255 kilometers which is the altitude I want to circularize at. Right now I'm in a bit of an eccentric orbit and I want to make it as circular as I can. So there we go. Now, taking a look at my orbit here, I can see that my periapsis is out ahead of me. So what I want to do is I want to burn radially outwards to push up my periapsis and pull down my apoapsis and get that in and around uh, a circular orbit. And I think that ought to do it. That's that's close enough. And then it's just simple. My my period is a little bit too low. I want my period to be two carbon days. So that's simply just burning a smidge of prograde just to bring up my orbital period. Okay, and then we'll just shut down this engine now that we are we're all done. And then it's time to take a look at the fruits of our labor. So, let's see, we'll put on the communitron line so we can sort of see it. Again, what I'm shooting for is an equilateral triangle. Uh, let's focus on the moon here. So that it's centered, the orbits are all centered, and we'll zoom in. So, you can see I got my three satellites all going there. Uh, Junksat 3 is the one I'm on, Junksat 2 up at the top, and Comsat 1 is my other one. And uh, what's kind of nice now is uh, I don't need the big dish antennas, so I'm just going to switch out to uh, my mapping satellite. This was actually, it's Maxwell 2, I think I ended up calling it. Yeah, I did. And uh, now I don't need this dish pointing at Kerbin, so we'll turn this dish off. And you can see I can still have my communication. Do I have any science built up in here? I don't think so, but no, I don't. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, all I need is to have two dish antennas from these three communication satellites pointed at Kerbin. And then anything else that's in the Kerbin or the moon's area, we can communicate just with communitrons from now on. So that's going to be great. And that brings us to Valentina and the Kerstock. She is going to be the next pilot for the next Karayan mission. And she's heading up on her own because, uh, remember I mentioned earlier in this video that I have more Kerbals on the space station than I have vehicles that can bring them back down to the surface. So having her go up by, her spot, uh, by herself means that she has an empty seat in the Kerstock. And then Bill and Jeb will bring that down, and that will leave Valentina and Glafia. And Glafia is going to go on the next mission to the moon as well. She's been stuck on this station too long. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'll have one vehicle with two seats and two gerbils. <laughs> it'll, it'll all match up pretty well. And you can see actually here from the Kerstock that uh, I have changed the configuration of the lifter a little bit. I haven't changed the vehicle really at all, but I've changed the configuration of the lifter going with these uh, back, these BACC boosters. There they go. And the reason why I went with those boosters is because I was finding that the uh, smaller boosters, the, the chutes just weren't working on them. I don't know why. They'd always end up crashing into the surface, and I was wondering if maybe I was, they were too close to the ground when they deployed, perhaps. I don't know. So uh, I put the bigger boosters on there so they would end up being separated higher up in the atmosphere and that did end up 
resulting in them being recovered, which is what I wanted. And that also got me to reduce the size of the first stage. So the, the liquid fuel and oxidizer stage that's going right here is smaller than it was before, which means that it has a higher thrust to weight ratio in the upper part of the atmosphere, which actually helps with the ascent in the upper part of the atmosphere. Um, once the air thins out, you want to go basically as fast as you can. And there we go, we have had main engine cutoff because we've reached our desired apoapsis. So now it's just simply a matter of coasting to apoapsis and completing our circularization and then rendezvousing with the station. Um, and just to sort of explain my rationale for why I'm picking the crew that I have for this particular mission, um, it has to do with just maximizing the experience that I get. So um, Valentina here and Glafia. And the scientist, by the way, is going to be Chrissy for this particular mission. None of them have ever been to the moon. So that means they will get the full experience value for what they do in and around the moon. Someone who has already been around the moon um, will get less experience points. So, for instance, Bob, who's already done a flyby of the moon and gained a couple of experience points because of that. When I go, if I put him into orbit around the moon, which is worth three experience points, Bob only gains one. I explained this a few episodes ago. So uh, I always want to you know, get the maximum maximum bang for my buck out of these missions. But anyway, you've seen these rendezvous before, so we'll just cut straight to the docking. You know, these this radish capsule has this nice forward-facing window. So just to change things up, I'm going to do the docking from the interior view. I, I did this once before, but I think this might be a little bit more interesting because of the window. So I'm going to put the docking alignment indicator on this monitor here. Okay, and I had I did this once before, but the docking alignment indicator actually got a little bit messed up, and I discovered the reason for that is because uh, I had it on in two different windows, and for some reason that kind of messed things up. But anyway, I want to make sure that I do have I got the port docking port selected. That sort of sounds funny, and I want to make sure that uh, that is the docking port I want to go for. That somehow it's not selecting on the wrong one. So I'm just kind of rotating around and looking for the station. There it is. Okay, let's kind of look in here a little bit. Nope, that docking port definitely looks like a free port. So we don't need to change that. So we'll close that window. And now let's get ourselves into position for docking. And then we'll use the docking al alignment indicator and the view out the window to perform our docking. So again, we got to get that orange target down into the middle of our crosshairs. There we go. We get in the right direction. That's just about it. You know, all this Kerbal Engineer stuff's kind of in the way, so we'll close all these windows. There we go. Now, my central distance, I'm like 30 meters on the wrong side of the docking port, so I need to back up. So I am pressing the N key to thrust backwards. You can see that I'm increasing that central axis velocity, bringing down that, or up, I don't know, it's negative. Up, I suppose. Getting less negative, that central axis distance. There we go. And now we'll start to slow down our velocity. Now I'm pushing the H key, bringing that central axis velocity down close to zero. There we go. Oh, I'm actually a little bit positive again, but 0 0.07, that's pretty, pretty much zero. And then we'll rotate the craft. So our rotation angle is about zero. It's a capsule, I know, so it probably won't even look that much different, but it should be all right. Okay. And we are about six meters ahead of the docking port and about 24 meters away in a straight distance. And we are drifting in the right direction according to the docking alignment indicator. So now I do have to trust my instruments. Because I really can't see what I'm doing. I'll slow down my central velocity, central axis velocity. It's now down to zero. So I'll maintain that central distance of 5.7 meters. We are now 17 meters from the docking port. 16 meters from the docking port. 
And you know, I think from here on, I'll run this at two times speed, so this will go a little bit quicker. Okay, 12 meters. 11 meters. I would really love to start to see the space. Oh, there it is. I can see the waypoint for the station anyway. Coming into view. 8 meters. Central axis distance is a little over 6 meters. Nice. Okay, you know what? I think what I'll do is get rid of the waypoint that's on the station now that I can see it. I'll need that. There we go. And we are almost lined up. Seven meters from the docking port. You can see that green axis is almost on top of the white axis on the docking alignment indicator. So I'm very, very close to having this all set up perfectly. I did change around the RCS blocks. I've gone with less powerful RCS blocks. The ones I used to have, those sort of pop-up ones. Um, which, by the way, come from B Dynamics. I finally figured out what mod gives those to me. Uh, they come from B Dynamics, and so does that vector engine that you saw me, that jet engine that you saw me playing with last episode. That also comes from B Dynamics. It, they're, they're pretty cool parts. Okay, five meters away and closing in at about 10 centimeters a second. Four meters. Yeah, this is much better with the more timid thruster blocks because it's not a very big vessel. Three meters. And magnetic forces take over and we are there. And once docked, uh, we'll do some minor resource transferring. Um, the, actually, the thing to be really careful about with Kerbal Inventory System is to check the personal inventories of your Kerbals, especially your engineers, because you don't want them walking off with something. And so, Bill, sorry, you are not allowed to keep those endpoints. They're going to, these uh, pipe endpoints, they're going to stay right where they are. Um, but then again, once that was all taken care of, uh, it was time to put Bill and uh, Jeb into the older of the curse docks here, the one with the busted gimbal. We'll get we'll get rid of that one. And uh, ooh, Bill and Jeb only have 47 meters per second of delta V. Ah, uh, that doesn't include the monoprop that they have, and they have quite a lot. I, I think I think with the monoprop they should be fine. Sure, they should be fine. All right, so doing our descent burn here. And we are out of liquid fuel and oxidizer, so time to switch to monoprop. And again, you can see I'm using trajectories. The red dot is the Kerbal Space Center. I want to be put myself into the ocean to the east of the Kerbal Space Center. Just looking for that. Here comes that red cross. All right, a little bit more. Oh, that's fine. And look at that. There's still 1.42 units of monoprop left of the original 20. Easy peasy. <laughs> See, told you. Nothing to worry about. And as Jeb and Bill go blazing, less than 30 kilometers above the Kerbal Space Center, it's time to start thinking about an essential piece of equipment that this mission is going to require. The Karayan is not designed to land on the surface of anything. It probably could land on the moon if I really pushed it, but I'm not going to. No, instead what we have is a designated lander. This view affords us, I think, a little bit of a better look at our new launch pad. So yes, so this is the Kegel. And the Kegel is my Moon land, well not just a moon lander, I, pl I, I plan to keep using it, I want to take it to Minmus too eventually, but uh, that's in the future. For now, it's just on its way to the moon, actually that's not really true, it's on its way, where else? It's on its way to Kerbin Station, which of course is my staging area. I do like having this space station just as a staging area for these missions where you can assemble the crew and assemble the components that you need to put the, uh, the mission together. Anyway, you've certainly seen enough trips to Kerbin Station for this video, so uh, why don't we just cut to a look at our lander. You actually saw this lander uh, a few episodes ago when I was testing it, and it really hasn't changed 
too much since then. Um, it's the downside of it all is just a one person lander. And the reason why is because I wanted to keep its mass down. Specifically, I wanted to keep its mass down to under three tons. And it's actually a little bit more than that right now, a little more than three tons, but that's because it's got monoprop on it and these thruster blocks on it. Uh, but that's just for docking with the station. Once it's docked with the station, uh, those thruster blocks are going to get torn off and, uh, and that will get its weight down. And I want to keep its weight down because that will give me more latitude when I go to do my moon landing. So the Kegel will take the starboard docking port on the station, which is the only free docking port that is left. I still got to bring some additional crew up there, so I'll have to figure that part out. Uh, and then uh, Glafia is going to go out there and she's going to take off these thruster blocks because we're no longer going to need them. And we'll make sure to drain the monopropellant. And uh, I don't know, maybe we'll stick these thruster blocks on the side of the station down here to sort of, maybe that'll help a little bit with attitude control. And while Glafia is out here, uh, we'll do a little bit of a, a visual inspection of the Karayan. The Karayan has been out in space for, uh, for 44 days now. And uh, you saw in the last episode how one of the tanks sprung a leak. And we were able to deal with that and get it back in time. but Or get it back to the station without really losing too much in the way of fuel. But, uh, you know, doing an inspection, dang it, does, it allow you to do, does allow you to do inspections which hopefully can catch mistakes and allow you to extend the life of your vehicle. So uh, we're going to grab a whole bunch of spare parts here from the station habitat module. And then we're going to go do some inspections. So first thing I want to do is inspect the life support here. So we click inspect and it says this part seems as good as new. As this is the only life support container other than what's in the capsule, um, I'm going to repair the insulation anyway. Because if, if things went wrong with this uh, life support module he, or tank here, I would actually be in quite a lot of trouble. So we're going to do the repair and it says this should last a little longer now. I don't know if I did anything, but it seemed worth the try. And then we'll, we, I went up and inspected each of the critical parts, the tanks and the things as I went up. And uh, all of them said they were as good as new. So that sort of made me feel better. I got up to the main engine. That was a little disconcerting. It says that the battery in the tank are as good as new. The coolant line in the engine, Glafia isn't quite so sure about. Uh, that's because she's only level one. I believe for the coolant line, you need to be level two. And I believe for the engine, you need to be a level three engineer, which I'm nowhere near. I don't even have a level two yet. I'm close, but I'm not quite close to a level three. So if something goes wrong with the main engine, we'll have to improvise, which I can do because of the monoprop that's on this thing. This has a lot of monoprop on it. Um, so, uh, I could probably get them out of some sticky situations with that. But, uh, with that accomplished, all that remains is for us to get the remainder of our mission crew up here. And we're going to do that very soon, but I'm just going to make a very brief stop over here with Junksat 5 first. Now, you might recall a couple of episodes, Junksat 5 was placed into a specific orbit in around Kerbin, and then I, uh, set it up to go over to Minmus, where it's going to act, hopefully, as a communication satellite. And it is now into Minmus's sphere of influence, so it's time for us to do this insertion. Now, I do have a satellite, Junksat 4, that I want to match orbits with. So, for now, what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to uh, put a maneuver node here at the periapsis. And I not only have to uh, match the altitude of the orbit, but I also have to match the inclination, which I'm going to do largely by just eyeballing it. it it's, I'm undoubtedly going to be tweaking this orbit for a while yet because um, it's not going to be in all likelihood positioned correctly in relation to Junksat 4, so just getting it close is just going to be fine. And in fact, you can see here, as I'm, as I'm putting together the maneuver node, that um, the periapsis is actually inside the orbit of Junksat 4, and that's done deliberately because then that way my orbit will cross Junksat 4's orbit in two different locations. Um, and those two lo locations are the ultimate altitude that I want, and having it cross in two different locations gives me more flexibility as to where to do maneuvers and stuff. And all I'm doing right here is trying to split 
the apoapsis and periapsis on either side of my eventual desired altitude so that the orbits are roughly about the same, but I'm, I'm not doing any math or anything. I'm just really eyeballing it and getting it roughly about right. And then it's just time to time warp out to our maneuver node. Now, I do have an actual contract for this. I do have a remote tech contract. And uh, we should get this all, we should take a look at it and see how it's doing. And oh, oh, we already, we already going. <laughs> we already got 95% of the cover of the planet covered. Um, I guess that's not really too surprising. The two satellites are pretty close to being on opposite sides of the planet. And don't forget, I do have dish antennas pointed out from Kerbin's orbit out to here. So it's not surprising I got 95% covered. So six days for the shakedown. So hopefully in six days, this contract will be complete. I probably won't have all my satellites in place by then, but uh, that'll be good enough. Anyway, now that we're close to our maneuver node, we'll select JunkSat4 as a target and check on our phase angle with it. And our phase angle with it right now is 179 degrees, and I want it to be 120 degrees. So I'm too far away from it, so I need to catch up. And how I'm going to catch up is put myself into a orbit with a lower period. Now, Junks at 4's period is 24 hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to complete my circularize or my insertion burn the way I have it plotted out with the maneuver node. And then I'm going to adjust my period. I'm going to tweak down the thrust and adjust my period down to 23 hours. Okay, so it's one hour less. That should allow me to start to gain up on it slowly. Um, and then what we'll just do is we'll check back on this later and we will insert it into its proper orbit once I have it in the correct position relative to Junksat 4. But right now, it's time for us to move on to the last mission of this video. Yes, on the curse stock, we have the final member of our moon mission crew. That's not Bob, but it's Chrissy. Chrissy is going to be on her way to the moon. Bob has actually done a flyby of the moon before, so I'm not going to send him back to the moon, uh, at least not just yet, because uh, Chrissy will earn more experience for going there because she's never been there before. But Bob is going up to the Kerbin Station anyway, where he's going to mine the store while our moon mission crew head off, and our moon mission crew is going to be Chrissy here, along with Valentina and Kofia. And then Bob's going to mine the store, and he's going to be there waiting for what is going to be his next mission, which is going to be a similar manned landing mission to Midwest. So Bob doesn't mind having to wait around for that, because that's going to be a very exciting mission, too. But anyway, the, the whole rendezvous and everything, same deal as always, no differences, uh, except for the fact that uh, we don't have a docking port here for the curse dock. But that's okay because we got some major ship shuffling to do here. Uh, we got to make sure that the Karayan and the Kegel is all stocked up. And then we're going to uh, undock both of those and then dock them together. And then that will leave some space for the curse stock to get in there. Then we'll have to do a lot of crew shuffling about to get the right people in the right places. And then we'll be ready to go on to the moon. But all of that is going to have to be for the next episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.